Hello everyone and welcome to part two of our read aloud series for the stupendous dodgeball fiasco by Janice Repka. In our first part we were introduced to Philip Stanislaw. He is a young boy that was a member of the stupendous Stanislaw Circus family that performs with the Windy Van Hooten Circus but Philip was never really happy with his place there. He didn't enjoy circus life. He never really felt like he fit in. And so he has convinced his parents to send him to live with his aunt and uncle in a place called Hardingtown, Pennsylvania. And that was where we left off, and he is just getting ready to move to this new town to see what life is like outside of the circus. According to circus superstition, when a performer leaves the show, it's bad luck to say goodbye. Unless you want to jinx someone, the only appropriate parting words are, see you down the road. Take care of yourself, son, Leo said to Philip as they stood on the platform waiting for the Amtrak Limited. Philip was glad he was not superstitious. He clutched his ticket to his chest, needing to feel it against his pounding heart to remind himself that this was not a dream. There was a bench next to the train station's tiny ticket booth, but Philip was so full of nervous energy he thought it better to stand. Suddenly a whistle screamed and the train screeched into the station. A gust of wind from the train's approach almost made Leo's rainbow wig fly off. Matilda, Matilda grabbed Philip and squeezed. For a moment, he thought he might suffocate in the folds of her enormous polka dot dress. Uncle Felix will pick you up. If he's not there when you arrive, just wait for him on the bench under the sign. Philip felt mixed up. He wanted to smile and cry at the same time. Of course he was excited to go live with Aunt Viola and Uncle Felix. But would he fit in? All aboard, the voice over the loudspeaker said. Philip slipped his ticket into his trousers and kissed the teary spot on his mom's cheek. Leo held out his hand for a shake. Put her there, son, he said. Philip pushed back his shoulders proudly. And with a bzzz, the hand buzzer made Philip's whole hand tingle. Gotcha, Leo said. He hit a button on his neck strap and his bow tie spun. Philip wondered why his father always dressed and acted like a clown, even when he wasn't performing. He faked a half-smile and fumbled with his luggage. Pedro the elephant trainer had shown Philip how to mount an elephant many times. No one had ever taught him how to mount a train. Halfway up the steps to the passenger car, his suitcase fell. On his second try, the circus trunk slid back down. Finally, by holding his suitcase in front of him and bouncing it up one step at a time, while dragging his circus trunk behind him, Philip mounted the train. See you down the road, his mom called. And remember, his dad added, it's better to have your eye on the ball than a ball in your eye. Philip waved goodbye from the window by his seat. He was one of a handful of people on the train. The man seated closest to him snored. The ride itself felt like any one of the Windy Van Hooten circus trucks, but it gave him an excited feeling and goosebumps. He wasn't stealing through the darkness to another nameless place to put on the same boring show. He was heading toward a new life, in broad daylight, with his eyes open and it felt like anything was possible. The world flew past his window. Scattered houses turned into trees which grew into thick forests. The forest eventually thinned into meadows, which bloomed with wildflowers, which brought grazing cows. The cows dwindled, replaced by barking dogs in fenced in yards behind scattered houses. The houses crowded closer together as yards shrank into spaces barely big enough to hold them. Hardingtown Station? The conductor called. Next stop, Hardingtown Station. Philip jumped from his seat. He dragged his luggage down the aisle and pushed open the exit door. The platform where the two cars were joined together trembled like an inexperienced lion tamer. He tested it as if it were a tightrope, then held on to a metal wall handle for support. Through the glass on the door, he saw his faint reflection staring back. He was too skinny. His thick red hair jutted up in the back. His metal-framed eyeglasses jutted from huge ears. They sat clumsily on his short, pointy nose, which had a single freckle at the end. Philip stuck out his tongue. His glasses slid down his nose. Hardingtown Station, the conductor called. All off for Hardingtown Station. Philip was proud of himself for being first in line. He was off to a great start. No more square peg in a round hole. No more running from clowns throwing pies. No more tripping over his own two feet. Now just to get off the train without falling down the steps. He looked up at a sign. Welcome to Hardingtown, the unofficial dodgeball capital of the world, host of the annual Dodgeball World Series and Barbecue, home to the American Dodgeball Company. Visit the historical Dodgeball Museum. Philip continued to read the sign as the door opened. Dodgeball? He wondered what that was. He sat on a bench and watched people rush around. 
The weather was a bit dreary for late August. A fog had moved in and covered Philip's new town with mist. When he realized he was the only person left, he reached for the snack bag his parents had packed. And with a thump, a long green slinky snake shot from the bag. He could almost hear his dad's chuckles, even though there were now 200 miles between them. Philip checked out his bag. A cold hot dog, peanuts, and a candy apple. All his favorites, yet they seemed different without the blaring circus music and smell of grease paint, like they were old and stale. He nibbled the hot dog, trying to make it last. He wondered what he should do if Uncle Felix never came. Once a circus dog learns to ride a bicycle, it's hard to stop him. But it takes the trainer a long time to teach the dog to ride. The trick, his mom once told Philip, is to realize it's not a trick. It's a matter of patience. Philip was losing patience, waiting for Uncle Felix to pick him up at the Hardingtown station. He tried to remember what Uncle Felix looked like from the time he and Aunt Viola had visited the circus when Philip was five years old. No use. All the men passing by in their non-circus clothes looked alike. Philip saw the woman approach. She wore a tan raincoat and a serious expression. Her dark brown hair was pulled back tight. Accompanied by her stocky body, the hairstyle made her look like a juggling pin. Philip thought he should ask her the time. "'You must be Philip,' she said. She removed a plain white handkerchief from her pocket and wiped her hand with it. "'I'm Aunt Viola.' She shook Philip's hand with a firm grip, then wiped her hand again. "'You could catch a cold from a handshake,' she explained as she slipped the handkerchief back into her pocket. Philip liked the look of her face. Add a few more chin, then it had the same shape as his mom's. "'Your Uncle Felix was supposed to pick you up over half an hour ago.' Don't ask me how a man who has lived in Hardingtown all his life could get lost on the way to the train station, but he managed. Philip felt he should say something clever to make a good impression, but couldn't think of anything. I'm assuming this is yours, she said, tapping her shoe against his suitcase. He nodded. That one too? she asked, pointing at the trunk. Philip nodded again, hating his shyness. Well, I hope we have enough drawers, she said. As they walked toward the station steps, she asked... You do know how to talk, don't you? Philip nodded, then said, I mean, yes. Well, your Uncle Felix has the opposite problem. He never knows when to stop talking. They reached the parking lot and loaded the trunk of her brown sedan. I'll take the long route so you can get a look at downtown Hardingtown, she said. Philip had never seen a city close up before. The Winnie Van Hooten Circus Caravan bypassed cities to avoid traffic, and the circus tents were often set up on the outskirts of town. How crowded Hardingtown was! with its rows of sturdy, multi-storied buildings. Trees dotted the wide sidewalks, their trunks shooting up from tiny squares of dirt surrounded by yards of concrete. Traffic lights seemed to shout orders at obedient cars while streams of people rushed through crosswalks. Philip rolled down his window. The grind of the car engines and tidbits of conversations floated through the sedan. The fresh brew of a coffee shop mixed with the fumes from a dump truck. Near a busy intersection was a large domed building. To Philip, it looked like there were a zillion steps leading up to it. People were rushing in and out, and many were dressed in business suits and carrying briefcases. That's the courthouse, Aunt Viola said, where I work. You'll meet me there after school each day, and when I get off at 5.30, we'll drive home together. Where's the school? Philip asked. Four blocks that way. She pointed down a side street. You'll see it in the morning. Philip pushed his glasses up his nose and smiled. Tomorrow was August 30th, the first day of school. His mom had enrolled him as a sixth-grade student at Hardingtown Middle School, the same school she and Aunt Viola had attended. Over there, it's Newman's Trophies, Aunt Viola said, pointing to a storefront. Philip gazed at the trophy shop. In the window was a giant silver statue of a man in a victorious pose. What's that? he asked. That, said Aunt Viola, is the most coveted prize in Hardingtown, the Dodgeball Master Championship Trophy. It was three feet high and took up most of the window. They award it once a year, she explained, on the last day of the annual Dodgeball World Series and Barbecue. Even from the rear window as the shop began to shrink with the distance, the trophy still looked huge. Over there is the Hardingtown Hotel, she said. That's where your Uncle Felix used to work. He was a valet. You know what a valet is? Philip shook his head no. He parked cars for the hotel guests. When the hotel lot was full, his job was to find another place in the city to park the cars. Nearly a year he worked there. Then he forgot where he parked a couple of the cars, and they fired him. She clicked on the sedan's left turn signal. He's got a job as a seam inspector at at the factory now. You can see the smokestack from here. Philip looked off to his right. A smokestack jutted out from above the roofs of the well-maintained row homes. 
It had neon letters that lit up one at a time, spelling out American Dodgeball Company. Philip remembered the train station sign, the unofficial dodgeball capital of the world. What is dodgeball? he asked. The car jerked to a stop. Dodgeball is Hardingtown, and Hardingtown is dodgeball, Aunt Viola declared. Philip gave her the same blank expression he used to give his dad when he told a new joke. A car began blowing its horn, and she accelerated. I thought it was some kind of a game, Philip said. Of course it's a game, said Aunt Viola, but here in Hardingtown it's more than that. The American Dodgeball Company is the city's biggest employer. There is no greater honor in Hardingtown than being inducted into the historical Dodgeball Museum's Hall of Fame. If you want to get along around here, you'll have to play. And that was the end of it. They continued in silence. Aunt Viola pulled the sedan off the main street and through an alley. A sharp turn led up a steep hill. Houses lined the hill, lined the side of the hill like a staircase. Cars were crammed together in front. Aunt Viola found an empty space near a narrow, Victorian-style row home. Well, this is it, she announced. The brightness of Aunt Viola's clean white house made the dirty white houses on both sides look almost gray. Inside, it smelled like disinfectant. Aunt Viola gave Philip a tour. The whole time she was pointing out the kitchen and the laundry room and the pantry, Philip seemed to hear an echo. If you want to get along around here, you'll have to play. When she showed him his bedroom, Philip noticed a picture of his mom on his nightstand. So you won't get homesick, explained Aunt Viola. Philip had never seen his mom looking so young. She was wearing a red knit sweater embroidered with the initials H.H. As he fell asleep that night, Philip couldn't help but wonder. Why had his mom never told him about dodgeball? Circus lingo can be confusing to outsiders. For example, a circus cookhouse is called a pie car. But the term cherry pie means doing extra work for extra pay. If you go to the pie car and order cherry, you're likely to be washing dishes on an empty stomach. Philip found non-circus lingo equally confusing. Cat got your tongue? Uncle Felix asked him between bites of crunchy breakfast cereal the next morning. A fruity puff dripped off the edge of his mouth and landed back in his bowl. He was a thick-necked man with ferociously curly blonde hair that made his head look huge. Together with his chunky torso, skinny legs, and petite feet, it created a strangely shaped body that resembled an upside-down juggling pin. Exactly the opposite of Aunt Viola, yet a perfect upside-down fit. Uncle Felix's lips rested so little, Philip wondered if he talked in his sleep. Huh? Philip asked. Oh, I know you're probably nervous about starting school this morning, but let your wise old uncle set your mind at ease. He cocked his finger and pointed it at Philip like a water pistol. You're going to have a great first day. Philip sighed. I hope so. Oh, I know so, said Uncle Felix. I remember my first day of fifth grade like it was yesterday. One of the best days of my life. You mean sixth grade, said Philip. No, no, I mean fifth grade. My first day of sixth grade was a complete disaster. But I'm going into sixth grade. Oh, sorry, said Uncle Felix. I forgot. He passed Philip the box of cereal. Better eat. Don't want your stomach grumbling all morning. Philip sprinkled the cereal into his bowl while Uncle Felix recited the list of vitamins and minerals the box promised in every serving. The tiny hard balls of cereal pounded against the ceramic with clinking sounds. He poured in milk and watched the cereal floating. Philip always lost his appetite when he was worried about something. But he didn't want to make stomach noises in class. Go on, said Uncle Felix. Fill her up. Philip forced the spoon into his mouth and chewed. The cereal was too sweet and the milk tasted like it was about to go bad. I haven't thought of my first day of sixth grade in a long time, said Uncle Felix. Man, everything that could go wrong did. First, I wore the wrong clothes, completely out of style. Philip looked at his blue jeans and plain gray t-shirt. Was he dressed okay? His ears felt warmer like they always did when he got nervous or upset. Then, I lost my lunch money, had to borrow from the office. Philip thought about a hole he had in the pocket of his jeans. Which side did he put his money into? He took a paper napkin from a holder on the table and wiped his sweaty forehead. Oh, then when I got to science class, there was this horrible smell, and I threw up all over the science teacher. Philip dropped his spoon. It whopped into his bowl, sending milk splattering. His ears were so hot they felt sunburned. I have to go, Philip said, darting from his chair. I don't want to be late. Yeah, good idea, said Uncle Felix. You'll get detention if you're late. Philip rushed to the front door. Hey, and if you ever need to talk about your worries again, Uncle Felix called after him, but Philip was out the door before he could hear anything more. As soon as he got down the hill, he started to feel a bit better. The walk to school gave him a chance to cool down. Aunt Viola had written him directions to Hardingtown Middle School, and he found it with ease. But once he was close up, 
The three-story brick building seemed huge and intimidating. The inside was even worse. It was a maze of halls and classrooms. The map the office woman gave him did not show the floor plan. It only listed subjects and numbers. Philip wondered what the numbers even meant. A bell rang and children hurried into classrooms. Then it was quiet. Philip crept down the hall, peering into each window. The rooms were large. So were the students. Everything seemed huge except him. Hey, you! A deep voice boomed. Philip swung around so quickly he practically knocked the voice over. It belonged to a lanky girl with shoulder-length black hair. She was wearing khaki pants and a red t-shirt with a big check mark at the top. A faded blue sash hung from her left shoulder to her right hip. Get to class, kid, she said. Philip froze. The girl took a step closer. I said, get to class! Philip looked at the classroom to his left and the one to his right. Either one had to be better than staying in the hall. Give me your schedule, the girl snapped. What? Philip asked. Your schedule, she repeated. Your class schedule. You mean my map? He asked, holding the paper up. The girl snatched it. First period, English. Room 209. It's over there. Oh, thank you, Hall, Philip said. What did you call me? She asked. Philip looked at the name patch sewn on her blue sash. The end of it was curled inward so he could not read the entire thing. Hall? He said. You trying to be a wise guy? No, no, your name tag says Hall. Isn't that your name? The girl glanced down at her sash and swept the drooping patch back. It read, Hall Monitor. My name, she said, is B.B. Tyson. And for your information, nobody makes fun of B.B. Tyson. She held the schedule out and let it drop to the floor. Now get to class! Bebe turned and stomped off. Philip scooped up the paper and raced to room 209. Once he got settled in his seat, his breathing started to return to normal. He noticed the kids raised their hands before speaking. They also handed one another papers folded into triangles. Mr. Morton, a thin-haired man with a long beard, was talking and holding up books they would be required to read this year. He took a piece of squeaky chalk and wrote on the board. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Groans were heard, although Philip, who had already read the novel, was pleased. When his mom tutored him, he read one piece of classical literature each week. Reading was by far his favorite subject. By the end of class, the churning in Philip's stomach was nearly gone. The kid behind him told Philip how to find his next classroom. The class after that, he found on his own. At lunch, someone asked what school he went to before. Philip didn't want the kids to know about his circus pass, so he only said he had a tutor. A group of kids in polo shirts let him sit with them. They talked about preparatory academies, and they asked him what it was like to have a private tutor. He said it was lonely, especially since he had no brothers or sisters. After that, Philip mostly ate his watery spaghetti, nodded, and smiled. In geography, Philip raised his hand when a teacher asked where was Walla Walla. He knew the answer was the state of Washington because the Windy Van Hooten Circus had been there. But the teacher had called on the girl sitting in front of him. Philip checked his schedule. His last class was gym. What was Jim? There was no classroom number listed. Philip turned down a new hallway. He saw double doors at the end. The glass in the doors was covered in wire netting. Above it, it said, gymnasium. Philip looked inside, and it was like a circus arena without the tent. In the center was a performing area. Basketball hoops hung from the sides. A knotted rope spilled down from the ceiling in the corner. Boys and girls sat on the bleachers that lined the walls. Philip went in and sat with them. A man wearing a black baseball cap was in front of the crowd. He had a dimpled chin and a silver whistle that hung from a string around his neck. When he blew the whistle to quiet the crowd, Philip half expected to see clowns ride unicycles onto the floor. The man introduced himself as the coach and told them that they would have gym class every Monday. He talked about proper gym clothes and teamwork and pushing hard. He held a clipboard and each time he said something he would raise the clipboard and make a mark. After he was done, he asked if there were any questions. Philip thought about asking why the gym smelled like dirty socks when everyone had their shoes on, but decided against it. Coach looked at his watch. We still have 15 minutes. Let's play a little dodgeball. Count off. Philip heard the kids around him counting one, two, one, two, they said. When the kid next to him said one, Philip said two. One's on the left, two's on the right, said Coach. The group split in half and the kids went to opposite sides of the gym. Coach placed three dodgeballs along a line in the middle of the gym. The stiff, inflatable balls were made of the kind of hard, grooved rubber that looked like it could remove skin at high speeds. 
Coach blew his whistle and kids from both sides ran to grab the dodgeballs. One kid doubled head over heels as another beat him to a ball. The kid who got the ball cocked his tongue and threw the ball over the line at the other team. To Philip, the players looked like clowns chasing one another around the circus ring throwing custard pies. A kid jumped with both feet as a ball whizzed past ankle high. His teammate grabbed the ball and sent it zooming back. A petite girl with a ponytail took it in the side and splattered onto the floor. You're out, Coach yelled. The girl crawled to the bleachers while the boy who threw the ball chuckled. It reminded Philip of the time his dad had given him the unicycle. As soon as he managed to balance himself, the clowns began chasing him, throwing pies. He hid from them on the trapeze platform for hours until Bartholomew the Giant finally came and helped him down. Philip still had nightmares about clowns throwing pies, trying to land one right on his kisser. Nothing frightened him more than the thought of lemon meringue stuck in his nostrils. At least until now. Each time a kid got hit, Coach yelled out and pointed. The kid who got hit would have to sit on the bleachers. Philip could practically see the whipped cream streaming down their humiliated faces. He could hardly believe that the kids with dodgeballs were purposely aiming at the ones without them. Whap! A boy standing near the line got it in the gut. Whap! A girl who had turned to run got it in the back. A ball zipped so close to Philip he could hear the air scream. The girl next to him twisted to avoid a low shot. She slipped and the ball hit her as she lay on the ground. A circular red spot formed on her exposed back thigh before she staggered away. Philip had lost three quarters of his team. Fewer kids meant more balls thrown his way. He caught a glimpse of the clock. Maybe he could survive until the bell. He backed himself into the far corner in retreat. Get the new kid, a familiar voice yelled. It was B.B. Tyson, the hall monitor. She lobbed a screamer right at him. It barely missed. There was no place to go. Philip's head brushed against the rope hanging from the ceiling. Without thinking, he just jumped, grabbed the end of the rope, and began yanking himself up as fast as he could. B.B. unleashed another screamer at him. Get him, she hollered. A ball zoomed by as he climbed. The rope swung, making him harder to hit. Closer to the ceiling, the balls dropped short of him. He was safe. Hey, Tarzan, yelled B.B. She tossed her ball and beat on her chest, mimicking the character. It's George of the Jungle, another kid shouted. Philip surveyed the herd of sixth graders. Most of the kids who weren't making fun of him were bent over with laughter. Coach blew his whistle. That's enough, he said. And as if on cue, the bell rang, and the pack of howling children raced out of the gym. They were all gone. Philip breathed a sigh of relief. Until he realized he was still 20 feet in the air, and like a cat stuck in a tree, too afraid to climb down. That'll make a good stopping point for part two. So Philip has not gotten off to the best start possible at Hardingtown Middle School with that unfortunate encounter with B.B. Tyson. Now, Philip was certainly not intending to mock her or make fun of her or insult her in any way, but when he accidentally called her Hall, mistaking the Hall monitor patch for a name tag, she really got up in arms about that and then looked to take it out on him later that day in gym class, trying to target him specifically, then mocking him when he climbed the rope, which, I mean, seemed like a reasonable way to get away from getting hit by a dodgeball. And so... While the beginning of the day started poorly and the end of the day ended poorly, he at least had some moments where he started to feel a little bit more comfortable in the middle. Now, as far as how things are going to play out and whether this conflict with B.B. Tyson continues to grow, you'll have to join us for part three to find that out. Bye.